atmosphere in which I got born again. And, and it was a different time and a different place. And, and maybe, uh, I'm not sure whether that was a better time or a better <laughs> place or, or just a different time and place. But it was a time when you could be quiet before the Lord and that you could let the Holy Spirit just move and, uh, and, and, and you would worship. And, and it would be not just a feeling, it would be just a, a genuine emptiness of ourselves and just, just letting God by His Holy Spirit just do in us what God does. And uh, sometimes I miss that because a lot of the current pace of mm. worship is, is very, it, it's meant to look fluid, but it's actually very constrained because there, you know, somebody else is doing a lot of that for you. You're not really interacting so much with the Lord Himself, you know, you're you're interacting with those who are are sharing their worship, and so I just encourage you, you know, you have this opportunity just to uh, sit before the Lord to receive from Him, and let the Holy Spirit just uh, uh, both drop into you and then bring out of you uh, some things for us as a body. And so sometimes we think only about worship as a uh, guess a, a horizontal or vertical experience, you know, and I think it's both horizontal and vertical you know, that God drops into us things so that we can distribute. And uh, that's one of my, my wife's favorite words, distribution. <laughs> she likes whatever it is, whether it's God's presence, God's power, or God's provision, she, you know, distribution, that's her favorite thing. So, uh, here in this place, you know, I just believe that's, that's the mind of God, is that we come before the Lord. We are empty. We are needy. And in that, we receive from Him. But we don't just receive to fill the void in our own lives. We receive so that we can reciprocate and we can move into worship horizontally with each other. Actually, I think uh, the scripture that we'll begin with in Galatians today gives to us a little insight into that. There's a, there's a whole a vertical part of worship and a horizontal part of worship. And uh, God depend. We depend on God, and God's depending on us. I mean, there's, there's, but it's a mutual dependency. And uh, as much as you don't think that God might be dependent on you, there's a world around you that He's incapable of ministering to, except through His body. He has chosen that method to minister Himself through, and so He's constrained Himself to the body of Christ. You know, and that's us. So we need to be able to be in that horizontal and in that vertical so that we can fill our own destiny and purpose. Amen? Amen. Amen. How many of you have ever tried to, to give out of something and you don't have a reserve? You, know, you, just, you don't have the means to give out. You know you should. You know it's, it's what God wants you to do, but you feel like you're incapable of it. That's where we need the whole vertical you know, worship experience so that we have the horizontal capabilities to express that worship. Amen. 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 So today we'll, we'll do a little bit of, of uh, application to that today. So, uh, but right now what I'd like to do is, uh, I remember the days when people would come in prayer lines and things like that and be there for, you know, hours, everybody just be waiting and praying and waiting and praying, you know, and, and the miraculous uh, would break out as it were at times, you know, and everything. So I don't necessarily want to have a prayer line, but all, what I want to do is I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you as though uh, we were standing just person to person, believing God and ministry. And uh, just because I believe the atmosphere is right for us to receive. So let's just uh, put ourselves in that place right now as, as Trees just continues to, to minister to the Lord. And what we're going to do right now is I want to pray for you. I, I got born again when I least expected it. I, I really did. That was the most monumental change in my life came when I least expected it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did not have a great expectation. I was not prepared for what took place, but I was willing. And so maybe you're not prepared for uh, an, an interaction with God right now. Maybe there's just a lot on your plate, a lot on your mind, everything. But what I would like for you to do is just, just be open right now to letting the Holy Spirit reveal Himself in a new and fresh way. So right now I want to pray for you, and I'm going to pray a simple group of prayers that I believe are from the heart of God. And I just want you to be open. To 
Just let the Holy Spirit minister to you. So right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you can uh, have your heads bowed, eyes closed, doesn't matter, but, but just, uh, just right now, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit just to minister. So Holy Spirit, I, I pray right now, I'm asking in Jesus' name, that you would minister to each person. And what I want you to do is, is in response to that, I want you to say, Holy Spirit, minister to me. Can you do that right now? Say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit minister, minister to me. Minister to me. In Jesus' name. In Jesus. Jesus' name. Hey, when you did that, you flipped a switch. You gave, you gave God the authority. He's, he's, he's always got the power. That's never an issue. But, but you gave God the authority. It's like a light switch. The power is always there. Somebody's got to flip the switch, which is giving authority for that power to flow. So in the name of the Lord Jesus, you gave the Holy Spirit the authority to minister right now. And now, Holy Spirit, because you are the power and presence of God manifest here among us on earth, I, I ask that right now you would pour into each and every vessel. And that you would reveal yourself in a powerful and special way to each and every person. I'm appreciative that you use the scriptures and your word to encourage and reveal yourself to people, but I also know that you reveal Jesus personally to people, and I ask right now, in the name of Jesus, that Holy Spirit, you would begin to reveal Jesus to us in greater measure. And if for those who've not even had the revelation of Christ as Savior, I pray you reveal him as Christ, the Savior of their life right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And for those of us who know you, Jesus, as Savior, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us as Lord, and then reveal to us by the Holy Spirit ways that we can provide you proof of your Lordship in our lives. Ways that we could prove to ourselves. Ways that we could prove to the world around us your Lordship in our lives. In the name of Jesus, breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Breathe on us, Holy Spirit, and as you breathed life into the clay vessels that were formed by the very hands of God. Breathe life in this place, in this time, in the busyness of this season, in this moment in our physical bodies, in our overwhelmed minds, in every area where we need the revelation of Christ to be fresh and new. Breathe into that area of life right now, into my life, into each life, Breathe that fresh. Make us alive again. In the name of Jesus. We said yes, Holy Spirit. We said yes to you earlier, and we say yes to you now. Yes, Holy Spirit, flow. Yes, Holy Spirit, breathe life. Yes, Holy Spirit, bring refreshing. In Jesus' name. Now, this is not a mental thing. Although your mind will be affected by what takes place, it's a spiritual thing. And your spirit is what's receiving from God right now. In Jesus' name. Your, your mind will catch up later. It'll, it'll, it'll get something out of this time you have with God. So, just believe that now. The Holy Spirit is, is ministering to your spirit. And out of that, your mind is going to become soothed or... or changed or whatever it needs. But it's it's coming because of that Holy Spirit action on the inside of us. Amen. God is good. Amen. All the time. Well greet one another because there's a there's there's a little room between you and probably the person next to you and back of you or in front of you. So greet one another real quick together. So the first is going to be a cornerstone for a couple of different ways of thinking about the scripture here. And, it, and it, I'd like for you to go with me to Galatians, the fifth chapter, and we'll look at the sixth verse together. And uh, different translations have a good way of putting it. Uh, so I just got the New King James. So when you found your version there, we'll, we'll read in we'll silently in your version. I'll read aloud from mine. Five, six, seven. Yes, please. And uh, unless, of course, it's not. What did you say, Galatians 5? 5 6. 5 6. 
And uh, this is kind of a, a I, I don't want to uh, take it out of context, so I want to I want to be sure that you that you have the context here. Um, and and I think that the application is very very broad. And so um, when I read it, I'm not reading with any one interpretation. I'm actually uh, going to apply it in a very broad interpretation, but give you the the scripture for the principle that will apply to the very broad application. And uh, in verse 6, it says, For Christ Jesus, in, I'm sorry, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Now, yours may say uh, faith working by love. Yours may say expressing itself by love. Um, whatever your version is, you can see that these two things are, are uh, what others may have called the power twins. Hmm. You know, they are, they are always working together to help each other. I'm going to step back there and turn off the uh, reverb real quick. There you go. All right. Sorry, with that on my mind, it was kind of hard to keep it straight. All right, uh, so love and faith, these things, uh, first of all, we know God is what? Love, love. If, when I say in the context of the scripture that says God, I'm sorry, love and faith in the, in the context here, and I say God is, and we all would want to say love, right? Amen. Because I'm talking about love and faith. Um, but it says here that circumcision or uncircumcision basically says, hey, it doesn't really matter all the, the outside externals. What really matters, if you want to both love God and prove that the God of love lives in you, there's going to have to be an expression of some sort. Haven't we seen that throughout the scriptures when it comes to things like John? You know, John says, how can you say that you love God who you've not seen if you can't love your brother who you can see? Right? So there, there has to be, in order for the unseen God or proof of the unseen God residing in a seen person, there has to be some expression, obvious expression, doesn't there? Now, it doesn't mean that we work up the love for other people so we can prove that we love God. It's quite the opposite. It's a dependency. And I mean, uh, I've I just been watching the news lately, and you see these, these, uh, these certain states that have a... Uh, out of control or rampant crisis with drug addictions and in, in particular in heroin and certain strong opioids such as that that people are so I mean you might have seen it on the news right that parents who fall asleep at the wheel because they, they stop at a light or pull over to the side of the road and just can't control the, their own bodies because they're so under the influence and even though parenting is a strong drive this drug has overwhelmed their parental you know, capacities. And so you can see how an, an, an addiction like that can be overwhelming. It can control your life. And in this case, this addiction that we have to understand that we are and have is to Jesus himself. And that this is a requirement. It is, it is an injection that takes place at new birth that has made you a forever addict. <laughs> it's it's Jesus said, you know, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, how much more hopeless can that statement be? Apart from me, you can do nothing. I mean, that it brings such hope and it brings such hopelessness all in the same time, you know? Because he's saying, you know, without me, you can't do anything, which implies that I am the vine, you are the branches in me. You can be fruitful. Yes. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Which to a person who is apart from Christ is mind-blowingly hopeless. But to a person who's in Christ saying, you are the vine, I'm the branch, that gives me hope. There's going to be life that comes through me. There's going to be things that, that I can do that I couldn't otherwise have done. There's going to be a hope and a life ahead of me that was hopeless and lifeless without you. And this is all because of this addiction that we have to Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> it is a reality 
that apart from him we can do nothing. Mm. And this is one of the things that, that Paul's trying to say. He says, look, you can, you can get circumcised or you can be uncircumcised. It really doesn't matter. He says what, what, what matters most is that we have uh, faith expressing itself through, some say, acts of love, or through love. In other words, I've got a love connection with God that makes my faith possible and keeps it sustaining. It sustains my faith. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing to think that, that as a Christian, I come into, in fact, if you, if you read about the, the, the book of Galatians here, you know, he, he's talking about people who have been birthed into this relationship with Christ, but are now trying to perfect this relationship through Christ through natural means. <laughs> he says, you came in through the Spirit, now you think that through the flesh, you can bring perfect something that was begun in the spirit. It's like trying to nurse a baby outside of the environment in which it was born. It can't. It, it, it has to be nurtured in the environment in which it was born. And so you can't perfect a, a spiritual life in a natural means. Amen? Amen? Mm -hmm. So he's reiterating that our dependency and our desire needs to remain in God. And uh, I think that that's a sobering way of us to think about where we are today and what we have in the days, months, and weeks, and days, years, maybe, until the coming of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Go with me, if you will, to Hebrews in the 13th chapter. You may have heard me share a little bit about this in some ways. I wanted to just refresh us in this because I think that this was, this was part of of where the Spirit of God was taking us throughout this time again. But um, that'll be the Hebrews and the uh, 13th chapter. And then we're going to look in the 5th and 6th verses. How many of you have ever felt sorry for yourself? Mm -hmm. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> you said that. You said that so in synonymous kind of thought with feeling sorry for yourself. No so, uh, but if you've ever felt sorry for yourself, you know, you, you can identify with things. And, and, and how many know that you knew that when you started going in that direction, I want to say fall into that trap, but when you, when you start going in that direction, you know it's not the right direction. But you find yourself just kind of feeling sorry for yourself. Whether it's the, the fact that you're married to that good for nothing. Oh, no, no. no. You know, or whether it's the kids that, you know, if, they, if it wasn't for them. Or if it wasn't for the fact that, it, that, that my job. Or if it, if it wasn't for the fact that I don't have enough money. Or it wasn't for the fact. And, you, I mean, you just start. If, if I didn't live in this neighborhood. If I didn't have this cruddy neighbor. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And we start feeling sorry for ourselves. Isn't that right? Now. I don't believe that that's abnormal. I believe that each and every one of us, actually I could just, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> How many of you have ever felt sorry for yourself? Raise your hand. Yeah. Ah, I don't know. Okay, okay. That's, that's good. That means that the majority of people here are honestly saying, hey, I've been in that place, you know? And, and, and so you're not alone and it's not unusual to feel in that place. But it is a, 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 adverse thought to uh, the scriptures in particular in this one here. But uh, when I say how many people have ever felt sorry for yourself, I, I, I got an intriguing question. You know those questions that people ask you that there's really no answer to? The ones like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and nobody hears it. I don't even know what the end of it is. Um, but the idea here is uh, if you... Here's one of those, those weird questions, but it'll, it'll get you to thinking about this. If you send out invitations to a pity party, <laughs> right? I had one of those. And you're the only one that shows up. <laughs> was it a success or a failure? It's still successful. <laughs> <laughs> because you're gonna, feel, you're gonna feel really bad that nobody showed up. But at the same time, it's a pity party. Isn't that what it's all about? So anyway, it's one of those things where to get you thinking. And take that out on Twitter, that and see what you get back. It's a lose-lose situation. <laughs> <laughs> but that, yes, that is the bottom line. Is that it's a lose-lose it's situation. And we are almost 
uh, always put in a situation like that by the hand of the enemy. He comes in there and shows us everything that we're not, everything that we should be, everything that we could be if it weren't for, and then you fill in the blanks. And it's, it's one of those things where the enemy does this, and I don't even really think that's unusual. It's, uh, yeah, I've got a little note here in, in Matthew uh, 4, 9, and there's other portions of Scripture in which Jesus was, was uh, in, the, in the wilderness being tempted. And he was, he, I mean, when we think that he was in all points tempted such as we, but without sin, there's, there's a couple things that you, you've heard me say before, and, and, and for the sake of being sure that we all are on the same page, I'll say again, but it is no sin to be tempted, right? If Jesus was in all points tempted, such as we, but without sin, then it is no sin to be tempted, right? right. So we got that down. But at the same time, if you look at the, at the temptations of Jesus in, in the wilderness, it, it's kind of amazing because they are extreme. But they're so relative to, to the same kind of temptations that we experience, but they are also to the extremes. Uh, for instance, to be taken up to the top of the temple and then uh, told to throw yourself down is a suicidal thought. Many people would never think that Jesus was ever tempted to commit suicide. They would never say that. But if, you, if the reality is that he's taken up at the top and, and told by the devil, throw yourself down, that is a suicidal thought. And those are the things that, that young people and, and uh, old people and everywhere in between think about at some time in their life and, and think, that that's me, that there's something wrong with me. And yet we realize there's, there's nothing wrong with Jesus. He was, he was perfect. And, and yet these same things were brought to him by the enemy mm. and resisted, and yet without sin. So the idea is that, that these extremes that we see in this wilderness experience. One of those is, 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 is not just that particular one. We moved on to another one, which was he was shown all the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them. All right, think about that. Uh, all the kingdoms of this world. Have you ever wanted to rise to the top? Oh, yeah, maybe it's a little pond you're in. Maybe, you know, you just want to, just, just want to be recognized at church, you know? Or, 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 or maybe you just want to move up at your job. You know, what? you ever want to just rise up? You ever want to be up there at the top? You ever want to be the boss instead of the worker? You ever want to be the one that tells everyone else what to do instead of gets told what to do all the time? Well, think of it like, I mean, when we think of Jesus being lifted up and then shown all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor, and the devil saying, all this will I give you if you will but worship me. We don't think of ourselves in that place. You know, we're not like, megalomania kind of a person where we're thinking of ruling the world and so this appeals to us. It's really more a matter of uh, when the devil wants to give you a position through means of a shortcut, through means of not having to do it God's way, there's, there's, there's a little shortcut we can take to arrive at this place, whether it's financial security, whether it's just to be the the boss instead of the worker. You know, all these things. We can understand from where Jesus was how that when the devil can come to us and make us discontent with the situation and try and cause us to be able to find a way to remedy our discontent. Have you ever been there? And we don't equate that to all the kings of the world and all the glory thereof, but in essence, it's just a mini version of that same thing which is, I'm discontent. I'm unhappy right now with what's going on in my life or my situation. And what I'd really like is a quick fix and way out of the situation that I'm in. Now, do you see the correlation between this grand temptation that Jesus, this extreme temptation that Jesus had, and the realities of the same thing happening in your life, in your situation? I want out of my unhappiness and I want a quick remedy for my situation. Amen? Now, if we look at it that way, let's go over to Hebrews together. And we're going to read these two verses. They're kind of uh, not just about money and, 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 and not just about situations. Uh, 
I, I, I kind of think that they focus on happiness. In fact, the translation that I looked at was God's Word translation. I'll read it for you quickly in that one. It says, don't love money. Don't love money. Be happy with what you have because God said, I will never leave, or I'm sorry, I will never abandon or leave you so that we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I am not afraid. What can mortals do to me? What a, what a group, of, group of statements here. What a revolutionary way of looking at our daily life. If we could pick this apart and, and see how it applies to our immediate needs in life today. So I've done that in hopes that both the Holy Spirit and I can work together to help you to see some things in here that might make your week better, your month better, your year better, or thereby your life better. So let's start out with, uh, with, uh, with, with the first part. Don't love money. Now, other translations may say uh, beware of covetousness or something like that. And that that's kind of deep. But it, you know, in, in essence, it says don't love money. Now, the, the interesting thing is, is that we don't really love money. I mean, it's not like you take out your, your, your billfold, you open up, and you see a 5 or $10 bill or a $100 bill, you know, and you go, <laughs> and you just rub it all over yourself. You know, that, that's not at all what anybody thinks when they think of love money, do they? Do you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, you don't. That's cool. But uh, what, what we do think of is, when we hold that in our hand or we see that number in our bank account or whatever the case is, we, we, we connect that with a means of getting out of the circumstance that we're in, buying ourselves out of the circumstance we're in, and into a better place, right? When you see a large account of money, you know, let's say there's, there's a, a lottery winning, you know, and you, you, don't, you don't think about just rolling in money that's not what you think of. You think of, aha, this is now a means for me to buy my way out of the circumstances that I'm in and into a better place. Maybe that better place is a new home. I'm tired of fixing my plumbing. I'm tired of the air conditioner that only works half the time. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that, right? And then you're thinking, okay, this, whatever the dollar sign is, if it's, you know, 10 zeros or whatever, you know, this can now change the situation. I, I can sell this for peanuts and I don't have to think about it anymore. Now I can just go over here and buy my way into a whole new circumstance, a better place, right? And, and maybe you got a poopy car, right? And you, you know, you're tired of the window that doesn't crank anymore or the power that doesn't have any power, you know, the power window that doesn't power anymore. So everywhere you go, you can't even roll down your window. Yeah, it stinks, you know, I know, I know. But at the same time, when we see that money, we, we, it, it's now a way to buy ourselves out of that car. We you have any car we want. I could, I could buy a new car, a beautiful car, with everything that works. I'll sell this one. I'll give this one away. Who cares, right? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty generous when we got a huge amount of money in the bank. It's, it's the, re the reality is, is that uh, being able to be generous with what we have uh, when we don't have much is setting us up for being able to be generous with whatever. Amen? But here's the, here's the point. We don't really love money. What we, what we want or what we like about money is that it can buy us the idea of happiness. Buy us out of our unhappiness and into a better place. Okay? So when we say, don't love money, now do you understand what we're talking about? Don't put the kind of trust, the kind of belief, the kind of investment of yourself into money that only deserves to be given to God. In other words, to get you out of the unhappy place and into the happy place in life that you, you know God wants you to be, money can't be the means to take you there. Amen? So that's what it's really talking about. And then, listen to this. And this is how we prove it. The proof of it is what he says next. He says, don't love money. Be happy with what you have. Now, most people would think that means, well, if I've got $15 in my pocket, then I should be happy with my $15. No, that's not what it's saying at all. What it is saying is, such as you have, and continuing to say, 
For God has said, I will never leave or forsake you. Now this is where we come into the whole abiding in the vine thing that we talked about earlier. Is that if God has promised he will never leave or forsake us, to be happy with what we have is to say, I have a God who has promised he will never leave or forsake me. Isn't that right? Even when I deserve it, he will not. Now that's pretty awesome. Even when I deserve to be abandoned because I've had issues, isms, poor attitudes and things I've turned my back on or turned away from, he has promised in spite of that, he will never leave or forsake me. Amen? Amen? So it's not conditional, is it? Now money is very conditional. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it rewards them that love him. The money rewards those that love money. But God has rewarded us before we even proved we love him back. Amen? Amen. But here we, say, we see that what he's really talking about is a possession that money can never buy, it can never secure, and it can never, money can never take away, which is this relationship or dependency. I talked about people who have abandoned all natural parental and, and other affections for, for family and friends. They have abandoned that for this addiction. And the recognition is that they, they don't, most of the time, they are no longer enjoying it. It's now just become such a part of their being that they cannot live without. Mm -hmm. It's not about the enjoyment anymore. Because they don't enjoy going through the, the, all of the stuff to get the high. But now it's no longer just, I want to have fun. Now it's, I can't do without this. And I'll do anything to get it. And that's the reality of an addict. And if we see ourselves with that same addiction to Jesus Christ, abiding in the vine and knowing that without him we can do nothing, it keeps us in that place where we recognize our own hopelessness and helplessness apart from him. And it's not that God wants to pound us down and show us our inadequacies and our, our hopelessness and come riding in on a white horse and say, here I am to save the day, like Dudley do right. That's not what God's all about. Before we even knew he existed, he did this. So it has nothing to do with quid for quo or whatever it is. You know, it's, it's not the way that works. This is all just simply out of his grace and generosity and his great love for us. He's done this before we even knew he existed, before we did. All right, so he has said he will never leave or forsake us so that we may boldly say or confidently, some say boldly, confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I am not afraid. Listen to this. He actually says that this turns us into superhumans. Did you see that? He said that so that I may say, when I know my helper, when I have said, when I've confessed, when I've professed my dependency on God as my helper, not only have I rejected the capacity for any other uh, uh, material to supply that place in my life. Not only have I denied that any other material can supply that place in life, but I have now stepped over the threshold of one of the greatest fears known to man. That is, the fear of man. The fear of man is one of the greatest fears known to man. It is the thing that, that keeps you from being able to move into a destiny. So he says here that this profession that we can make, that, that you and I can make of our own volition and choice, can change all perspective. It can stop this dependency, the natural dependency that the devil uses to show that I can provide a means for you to get out of the circumstance or situation you're in through natural means. And it turns us into superhumans, which causes us to have the capacity not to fear men. You ever see a, a, a superhuman or a, a, a superhero? 
that was afraid of everybody else. That, that doesn't happen, right? Superheroes are not afraid of, what, of other men. They're not afraid of villains or supervillains, are they? Because they can't be superheroes if they're afraid of men. They stand up and they say, I am not afraid of what man can do to me. <laughs> that is a superhero stance. That's the position of a superhero, right? Because he has, he has now been able to overcome the fear of man. He is able to actually go ahead of others and for the sake of others, protect them and stand out and move, move ahead without fear because he's a superhero or she's a superhero or heroine however the proper terminology is. But you understand. So in this case, this confession that we can make that causes us to sever the enemy's tactics of, that he used with Jesus and uses with us, that we have to find a way apart from God to relieve ourselves of our unhappiness. Whether it's money, which is most likely the means by which we try to buy our way out of our unhappiness, our unhappy place, right? And so, then he says, the fear of man. You can be delivered from the fear of man. I mean, those two things, the dependency on, on anything or, or something apart from God to deliver us from our situation and into a better place, and the fear that if we step out or do something, that someone will cause pain back to us. That it will, that will result in our suffering from man, the hand of man. The opinions of others, the scorn of others, the demotion, whatever the case is. There's only one way out of it. And that is, according to the scriptures, we have to follow what Paul says here. And it seems like this can't really make much of a difference in your life because that's the way the devil wants it to be. He wants you to think that making a simple confession of faith according to what God's Word says can really never change anything. And yet, when Jesus finished the temptation, it says here that the devil left for a season. The interesting thing is, a few words from Jesus at the right season put him in a better place and gave him a respite from the enemies antagonizing for a season as well. Yeah, yeah, just a few simple words gave him a respite from the attack of the enemy for a season. Didn't mean that he totally threw up his hands and said, I'm never going to try again on that Jesus guy. He just whipped me. No, but it gives you a respite. It can make a difference. Today can make a difference. Amen. Just giving a few words of faith in alignment with God's word can make a difference today. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do, and, and seeing that is going to help you to see the benefit of it. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to follow Paul's admonition. He says, and I'm reading again from God's Word translation, don't love money, be happy with what you have, because God has said, I will never leave or forsake you. So that I can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid, what can your mortals do to me? Amen. Amen. In some cases, those mere mortals are, like Jesus said, the people of our own families. They're antagonizing, they're being hurtful, they're right now sometimes the means of the enemy causing a distraction and disturbance in our lives. Sometimes it's the people closest to you, sometimes it's the people you work with. But right now, to be delivered from the fear of man not because you've received some sort of a lottery winning and now you can just simply say, I will never have to work for you again. <laughs> I will never have to deal with you again. I will buy you a golden ranch and where you can torment no one, go live on it. You know, these, 
the reality is, is to be able to be free from the fear of man or the being afraid of mortal men is a beautiful thing. Be afraid of what they can do, what harm they can cause you, the, how difficult they can make your life, how emotionally stressful they can position themselves to be over you. To be free of that is to free me. And to be free of the constraints of all that the devil tells me I don't have or I am not. Because these two things are covered here. Covetousness doesn't just take the form of wanting more money. It takes the form of wanting what money can buy. It can buy me back self-confidence when I've lost that. There's, those things are what money tells you it can give to you. Is that right? I can have prestige again. People will respect me again. Listen, if you lost respect and you think you can buy it with money, you're sadly mistaken. Amen? Amen? But it's a deception. So what we're going to do is we're going to put out there everything in alignment with the scriptures here. I don't love money. I don't love money or what it can buy or do for me. You say, well, I already got that. I know that. Do you? Have you said it lately? Because it's only saying it that makes it so. Not just thinking it. So, we're going to say, I don't love money or what it does for me. Amen? Amen. I put it this way. I said, I'm happier with God in me than I am with what money can buy me. Yes. Now, you may be pure as a driven snow about your relationship to money, and it won't hurt you to make that confession. You may be a dirty, greedy, filthy kind of person. <laughs> And it will help you to make this confession. So either way, you win. Right? So, uh, but we're making a confession and saying, it is God who I have with me that matters most. Yes. Amen. And just putting that out there starts the right momentum. Amen. Amen. So are you ready? Yes. However you want to do it. Say, I put God before money or I value God with me more than what I don't have. Can you do that? Yes. All right, do that. Somehow say that to God. Say, God, you're first in my life right now. I value you more than money. I don't love money. I have no special affection for money. Money has no power or control over me. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, that's the first part of this. And then he says, uh, I'm confident, or I am confidently saying, he says here, I'm confident that the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid of man anymore. Amen? So, because I have espoused that the Lord is my helper. Right? Who's your helper? The Lord. The Lord is my helper. Say that together. Say, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. I will not fear. Now, the grand thing is, when I say, what man can do to me, that has a broad application. Amen? What any man has any ability to do, I right now in Jesus' name, I will not fear what anyone can do because God is with me. Amen? Amen? Right. I will not fear what man can do. I am delivered from the fear of man. Let's say that together. Say, I am delivered, I am delivered, delivered from the, fear, from the of fear of man because of my confidence of God being with me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now you've started momentum here. You walk differently among men when you do not fear. Amen. You walk differently among men when you do not fear them. Isn't that right? Uh, the, the devil has an uncanny ability to be able to, and it's, it, I think it's illustrated in much of the animals. They're able to distinguish when there's fear. And they play on it. You know? And uh, I think that when the enemy is involved in orchestrating relationships among people, when the enemy can tell that same kind of a fear in us, 
then the people that he's able to manipulate start acting on that fear to manipulate us. But I'm not putting that out there anymore. I'm not putting out a fear hormone or whatever it is that exudes that the animals are picking up, you know? I'm not putting that out there anymore. Because of my confidence that God is with me, it has severed that fear connection. And I walk differently among men. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. I'm going to ask just real quick, if you're here this morning and you can bow and bow your head and close your eyes, not, not because um, I, I, I don't think that, uh, that you, in other words, I just want that for the other people around you. I, I want you just to give a moment so that if anyone wants to signify to me that they would like to pursue their or further their relationship with Christ, their personal relationship with Christ. I, I just want those people who want to further their relationship with Christ personally, they've not yet established a true personal relationship with Christ, but you want to, then if you could look to me at this time, then I'm going to identify that as your means of saying, I would like to further my relationship. Okay. Thank you. And that relationship starts with a confession of faith, just like we made this morning. And that confession of faith is very simple. So, like, like everyone else, it's a win-win. When we make this confession, whether we've made it before or whether it's the first time, it's the same confession. For the ones that are making it for the first time, it leads to salvation. For those of us who are making it for many a, many a time now, it only confirms our salvation. Amen? So, what is that confession? It is simply this, according to Romans, it says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Shall be saved. So, that means that not only uh, during this life you have hope, or rather after this life you have hope, but during this life you have hope. So, Let's all make that confession of faith together. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord? Yes. Do you believe that? Yes. yes, I do. Okay, so I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Are you ready? I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Excellent. Now the rest of the scripture continues to say that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So now we just say, I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And I say with my mouth, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, according to that, with that, God's able to start the relationship with him. What you'll want to do now is you'll want to read. You want, to, you want to get to know this God who you've come into relationship with. And the, the primary way that you come into relationship with, with God and greater relationship with Him is, is to read His Word. So I recommend that you start in the New Testament and read about this God whom you're in relationship with. Because God isn't who I say He is. God isn't who someone else in your family said he is. He's not who your church says he is. He's who he says he is. Amen? Amen. And the only way you'll find out that for yourself is to see what he has to say for himself. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, so start. If you don't have a Bible, please see me. I'll be sure that you have one to read. Amen? Amen. Let's go ahead and receive this morning's tithes and offerings. Continue to be in prayer for our saints. I know Scholastica had, had recently, uh, should have had her children to join her in her new location in uh, Charleston. So um, you continue to pray for them. And uh, any others here who share requests and you remember, please do. White family, Sebastian, Dominic, my wife, her family, others. 
uh, and of course for our outreach starting on the 5th. So please remember to be in prayer for those things. Kat, you've already grabbed the basket, and I hope that's, uh, I hope that's uh, not just a training response that uh, I can call sealed, upon you yes. for prayer. Yes, I am a seal. <laughs> You're sealed. For grace. Um, but would you give thanks for this offering as we prepare to receive it? Father, we just praise you and thank you for your love and mercy and for your provision and that you are all that we need and you're our provider. And I just thank you for the offering that um, people give in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, I hope that what you heard most this morning was that uh, the scriptures have a much broader application than the devil ever wants it to apply and to be able to look at all the various ways that God's our provision for our lives and that the devil can't provide anything that we want and we will refuse his opportunities to take the easy way and go God's way. Amen? Yes. All right, well, let's fellowship.